Welcome everyone. It's really lovely to see all of you here today. Um, I imagine there'll be a few more people trickling in now as we start, um, but we're just going to kick off now because it's two o'clock. So um, we're really excited to present this webinar to you. We're really grateful to BAPM for giving us the forum. Um, and uh, we're going to start, I'm just going to talk you through a little bit about uh, what we're even going to talk about today and why it's important. So hopefully you're in the right place. You're here to hear about um, compassionate care. Um, it, it's a, a term that's peppered through the new three year joint working plan, uh, and we felt like it needed a bit more unpicking. Um, I'm Ellie Atkins. I'm the lead psychologist for the London Neonatal Operational Delivery Network, um, and I'm here with uh, a number of my colleagues uh, and I'll, I'll introduce you to them as they come. But before we start, just a little bit of housekeeping. This is the bit that, that in the past we would have said there's no fire alarm plan today, but now we are working in this new virtual world. Um, the first thing I'm going to say is that uh, it's really tempting to do multiple tasks while you're on a webinar, isn't it? To check your email, to be simultaneously writing something or planning something. Um, I'm saying that because I do that in quite a lot of webinars that I attend. And I think that, that if it was possible for you to be fully present, um, I think you'll get the most out of this webinar. We recognise the many challenges on your time uh, and that may not be possible for you to do that but where you can lay that aside and just be here um, and listen to what we've got to say because we think it's worth listening to. Um, we're going to have a panel discussion at the end rather than each speaker taking questions so please if you've got a question that you really want to ask somebody in particular please do put it in the chat we'll be collating all of those to bring to the panel at the end um, and feel free to direct them at one person if, if, if you're particularly keen to hear that person's view. Um, uh, and then if you could keep you uh, muted and keep your cameras off during the presentation, you're really welcome to switch them on when we have the panel discussion at the end. We were just talking before the, uh, the people who are presenting today about how nice it is to see the people you're talking to. Um, and particularly for what we're talking about, that engagement uh, with other people is really important to us. Uh, so uh, even though we can't see you, uh, please keep engaged. You can chat in the chat as well as just put questions there. Um, and we'd really like to hear how things are landing for you, what you're thinking. So let's get on. Uh, I'm just going to talk for a couple of minutes before we start uh, about what's important. Um, I, I found this quote and I think there is nowhere that this is more fitting than in a neonatal unit. This godlike technology that we have, the kinds of things we can do for 22 weekers, 23, 24 weekers now that we couldn't do even 10 years ago, let alone 50 years ago, uh, is incredible. But but that's butted right up against these Paleolithic uh, emotions that 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 we see everybody struggling with, with uh, our infants struggling with, our families and our staff, um, and it's that to that uh, that we'd like to talk about today. Now, uh, there's a sense when you do a webinar like this that you do talk to the converted. So um, the fact that all of you are here today tells me something about your belief that this is important enough to give up 90 minutes of your time. But I do imagine that there are probably people in the audience or people watching this afterwards who are, are thinking some of these things. Don't you understand that, that, that compassion, we can't talk about that when we're talking about the kind of cuts, the kind of staffing challenges that we're facing um, uh, in neonatal care at the moment. Um, or, yeah, compassion's love. Lovely, but uh, you know it's not the the most important. It can't replace the really important life saving things we have to do. Um, or it, we really do need to be having some grown up conversations. And you can go over there and talk about your nice fluffy things. Um, or or it, we need to measure. We measure what matters already. Temperature twenty four hours after birth is more important than the kinds of things. If it's not on the dashboard, we haven't got time to talk about it. Um, uh, uh, and I imagine that some variation of some of these things have gone through your mind, and certainly will have gone through the minds of some of your colleagues uh, who maybe haven't chosen to come today. Uh, and there's a reason for that, isn't there? We have professional codes that encourage us to be boundaried, uh, to be regimented, to look for the evidence base, to kind of uh, focus on uh, a, a certain stream. We're, we're, we're um, required by the dashboard, by data sets to focus on little things uh, that are quite specific, to not think about what might be important to an individual. We're worried about uh, personal judgment. We're worried about favouritism, all of those kinds of things. And I would really encourage you to look at this report um, by Julia Unwin, uh, which talks about public policy, specifically about areas like the NHS and government um, and, and the place for compassion in that. I was going to talk about it for longer, but I don't want to take up time because we've got some incredible speakers lined up to talk today. I would just like to say this. There are a number of myths about compassion. 
about the kind of psychologically informed care we're talking about today. These myths, um, uh, the King's Fund have talked in detail about, and you can look at some of their blogs, uh, that uh, it, it takes away from us being tough uh, or focusing on what really matters, uh, not challenging the status quo. Uh, it means that the power might be imbalanced uh, and it means that, that ultimately performance will suffer if we if we focus too much on compassion. Um, and I'd like to say that that's wrong. They are they're, they're called myths for a reason. Um, the, the reality is that there is a really robust evidence base for the kind of things we're talking about. Um, and you could go and look at them. We know things like cancer recovery rates are better uh, if compassion is included in care. <laughs> Excuse me. We know that um, PTSD levels after A&E treatment go down when care is compassionate. Mortality rate in acute care is better. We have lower infection rates, lower staff absenteeism, um, lower turnover, better team productivity. I could go on. That That's in the evidence base in the peer reviewed literature. So don't think that what we're talking about comes at the cost of the effectiveness of, of running of your units and, and the really good outcomes that we're all striving to achieve all of the time. Um, and it, it, the kind of compassion we're talking about is really robust, like those outcomes are really robust. It's an authentic concern with a need to do something that moves the service forward. So the other concern that I think lots of people have is, well, it's all very well, but look how much we've got on our plates at the moment. Uh, all of these things that we're being asked to deliver on all the time in our units. Um, every time we look, there's another checklist, isn't there? Another thing that we've got to be thinking about. And I could go on, I could have made many more circles. <laughs> Uh, and uh, really, uh, in the face of all of those kind of things that we're being asked to do every day on our units, where's the place for compassion? And I would put to you that here's the place for compassion, that compassion is everywhere. Um, it's the, the environment that, that is around uh, all of these things. And it's what connects up all of these things and makes them all make sense together um, is that the psychologically informed environment, that's where compassion sits. And so it, it overlaps and talks to every single one of these things that you're doing all of the time. And therefore, given the evidence base, doing this means we can do our jobs better and we can focus on what really matters. So I also want to highlight this, and this is going to come into Ruth and Davies talk in a minute as well. So I'm just going to talk about this really quickly. But we're talking in this webinar about compassion at all levels. Um, we're talking about it nationally. We're talking about it in the ODN structure and the reg regional organisation in the, the um, LMNSs and the ICBs. We're talking about it in sectors if your region is divided further down into sectors and at each individual unit level. And then within each individual unit, we're talking about it at the level of every family um, with all their different different needs and every member of staff. And I'd like you to hold that in mind as we go through um, today. So um, that's all from me. I'd just like to, to show you our lineup today. We've got an excellent lineup. Um, uh, and I'm going to hand over now to Ruth and Davy, who are going to talk about the anatomy of compassion. Thanks, Ellie. Um, let me just get my slides up here. So hopefully you guys can see that. Um, and yeah, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Davey Evans and I work as a clinical psychologist uh, and as the lead psychologist for the West Midlands Perinatal ODN. And I'm joined this afternoon in this part of the presentation by my colleague Ruth, Dr. Ruth Butterworth, who also works as a clinical psychologist and works as the lead psychologist mm -hmm. for the Northwest ODN. Um, and in this part of the webinar, what we're hoping to share with you is um, an understanding, a shared understanding and language of what compassion means, what it is, and really importantly, why it often feels so difficult to do. And um, we've been talking about compassion for many years. If you look through some of the um, Department of Health uh, documentation, you know, there's been guidance and uh, strategies for increasing compassionate care for a long time. Um, and we're still talking about it. And I think that's partly because, you know, it's it's not an easy thing for us to do. And I think that's going to be hopefully a thread that weaves through uh, the, the talks through this webinar. Um, 
important to say that you know there's lots of different views about compassion lots of different ways of talking about it and this is just one way of telling the story um but it's it's a story that for us is underpinned by uh, as ellie has explained a large evidence base a large empirical evidence base and it's also rooted in our own clinical practice of compassionate approaches uh, that we've used in maternity services perinatal and neonatal services um so it's both evidence-based practice and also practice-based evidence so really we come to this um uh, from the point of view of the, a document that was published an, a couple of months ago now as to the three-year delivery plan for maternity and neonatal services which puts um compassion up front as one of the kind of the key areas that we need to be thinking about in terms of improving the quality of care um not only in terms of listening to families uh, with compassion but also developing psychologically safe uh, cultures within maternity and neonates uh, through compassionate leadership it builds on um, recent reports by Donna Rockenden and Bill Kirkup as well as many reports uh, prior to those um, which have identified a lack of compassion for families and care and within team cultures as a major factor in some of the adverse outcomes that we see in this area um, in this situation, I think it's very easy. In fact, I would argue that it's it's a natural human response to fall into a pattern of blaming, um, blaming a lack of compassion for these difficulties. You know, a capacity to blame is a price that we pay for having the the, the tricky human brains that we do. Um, and unfortunately, what that blaming can produce is just more of the same. Um, and so, what needs to change really is. If, if we're going to engage with these kind of difficult and uncomfortable conversations uh, that these reports elicit um, is a real uh, deep understanding of what the compassionate mind is and that's what we're going to be sharing with you today. We decided to share with you uh, a brief quote um, just to kind of get people's um, minds attuned to the things that we're talking about. So this is a, a quote from Pema Chodron um, who said compassionate Compassion is not a relationship between the healer and the wounded. It's a relationship between equals. And only when we know our own darkness well can we be present with the darkness of others. Uh, and I think for me, this really speaks to the fact that we cannot talk about compassionate healthcare merely at the point of delivery um, in terms of delivering compassionate care to families. Um, it needs to be woven through the whole system, as Ellie's alluded to in her introduction. So here's um, a, a brief definition of compassion. Um, so this definition of compassion is uh, pr pretty widely accepted and used. Um, it's developed by um, a psychologist, clinical psychologist, Paul Gilbert, um, who is responsible for developing something called the compassionate mind approach. Um, and Paul Gilbert's definition of compassion is that it is a sensitivity to the suffering of self and others with a commitment to try and alleviate and prevent it. So there are, there are a ton of two psychologies of compassion. One is the approach towards others and one's own suffering. Um, and on the other hand, also this kind of commitment to try and um, alleviate uh, that pain. Uh, Ellie mentioned um, a whole host of empirical research that illustrates the uh, the significant impact of compassion in a healthcare context. Um, a book called Compassionomics written by Stephen Trezekiak and Anthony Mar uh, Mazzarelli. Um, Compassionomics tells us that actually compassionate systems are uh, financially um, and clinically and ac across a whole range of different outcomes um, uh, preferable. So what we see is that when compassion is included in the way that we do healthcare, patients' clinical outcomes are improved, the financial sustainability of healthcare systems are improved, and we see that also the um, the, the impact is, is on staff as well. So uh, burnout is lower when we bring compassion to our work, um, the resilience of, of teams um, and the health, the well-being of individual members of staff is also improved. So really there's a, a very compelling argument that uh, compassion is something that we absolutely must be uh, striving towards. Um, 
but we also know that this is a really difficult thing to do. Um, if you want to know more about the, the literature on the uh, the kind of the case for compassion, then th this book, Compassionomics, has got a lot of that. Uh, Michael West's book, Compassionate Leadership, has also got a large amount of um, literature and evidence base that is reviewed. Um, and I would encourage you to go and have a look at that. Um, I'm going to hand over to Ruth now, who's going to speak a little bit more about the kind of the underlying psychologies of compassion and how we can understand uh, what it looks like. Thanks, Davey. Um, so we've already recognised that compassion is essential, but also that it's really hard. Um, the compassionate mind approach, as David mentioned, is a model first developed by Paul Gilbert, and it's an evolutionary model that starts with an acknowledgement that our brains are built to do amazing things, but that they can also get in our way. Um, and similarly, the way we work together in systems can build ways of being with each other that are helpful and also ways that can make things harder. So the compassionate mind approach is built on an understanding of three emotion systems within which we sit at any given time. These are the threat system, the drive system and the soothing and safeness system. And I'm just going to talk through those briefly now. So each of the systems is said is essential for our survival and our success as a species. There's no good and bad here. They're all necessary. But the key to thriving is for the three systems to work effectively in balance with compassion right at the heart of that. So the threat system is effectively our internal alarm system, the bit of a bit of us that's alert to danger and focused on protection and safety seeking. Again, it's absolutely crucial to our survival as a species and it's associated with all of the emotions like anger and anxiety and disgust that are built to protect us from danger. As a species who rely on each other for survival, it's also often activated by perceived social risks. So fear of rejection or abandonment or shame or criticism. And this system is essential in some situations. So if you're faced with a saber toothed tiger or a crash bleep, but if it's switched on for too long, it can begin, begin to cause physiological and emotional harm. And in neonatal care, situations that might commonly trigger threats such as high levels of uncertainty or volatile emotions in others or physical vulnerability can feel really ever present in the environment with no easy resolution. So moving on, the drive system, in contrast, is also an activating system, but it's associated with much more positive emotion. So this system is built into our need to hunt and gather to seek out resources. It's associated with a sense of achievement and satisfaction. It's the bit of us that gets us out of the house to work, um, drives us to learn a new skill or to seek new experiences. And then there's the soothing and safeness system. So this isn't an activating system, but instead it's focused on contentment, on safety, on peace, on settledness. This is the bit of us that provides the conditions to connect with others, to reproduce or nurture our offspring. So it's also the bit of us that's often least prioritised within the culture that we live in, within the um, environment in the NHS that we work in. But as we'll see throughout today, um, to connect with our compassionate mind, to do our best thinking and to stay well, we need to be able to bring the green system to balance and settle the red. Davey. Um, and I just want to touch briefly on some of the sources of threat in neonatal systems, because every time I talk with colleagues across the system, I'm struck by how normalised this has become. Um, it can make it really hard for people to imagine how things could be different. So what we're trying to demonstrate here, as Ellie has already spoken about, is the different layers of threat within the system or the different levels of the system itself. And layers of threat can feed up and down and they often amplify and maintain each other. So right at the heart of this is our work with infants who are experiencing pain, stress or sensory overwhelm, often while separated from their primary source of soothing and safeness, their parents. And then our families themselves are facing high levels of trauma, distress, uncertainty, whilst also having to navigate relationships with each other and with the baby and with the unit team. And staff themselves are managing high levels of clinical risk, really complex decision making in an environment where it often feels like there's a really powerful rhetoric, as others have talked about, around blame and responsibility. They might also struggle with moral injury, a sense of witnessing or being asked to do things that go against their values and moral beliefs. And those are conversations we've been having more and more in our network recently. And then, of course, our unit leads are being asked to hold all of that while managing a never ending stream of targets and expectations with a staff team who are burnt out and still recovering from all that they've been through over the last five years. And at that widest level of the system, all of this happens in a social and political environment that's it's itself infused with threat and disconnection. So we see threat percolate down through the system and back up again. And then we wonder how it is that people find it hard to breathe. Next slide, please, Davey. So when we think about the three systems, we can see that for both families and staff, threat can be often huge and out of balance. And soothing and safeness can be really hard to come by in our environments. 
But what we also see is that for both, but particularly for staff, our drive system can often become suffused with threat. So where once we were driven by the joy and satisfaction that we got from doing our job well, over time the work can become a way to manage threat. Have I done this so I don't cause that harm? How can I go above and beyond so that people don't find out I'm a fraud or criticise me? And this is known as threat-based drive. And over time, that overlap between threat and drive means that the sense of joy, achievement and satisfaction in our work can be eroded. And so it makes it even harder for us to come back to our compassionate mind. Next step, please. Thank you. Um, so to think about the impact biologically on what's happening in our system and why we might need to think about compassion in that kind of full body context, I just want to um, slightly embarrassingly connect with all of my much more medically trained colleagues on the call <laughs> with my understanding of the way that the brain works. So if we think about this fist as being um, an emotionally regulated brain that's responsible for making rational, compassionate and wise decisions, um, the amygdala, the prefrontal cortex and the brainstem are all closely connected to each other. So the wrist is the brainstem and that part's connected to the spine and is responsible for alertness, sleep, heartbeat, other involuntary bodily functions. And the th thumb folded across our open palm is representing the midbrain where emotions are processed and memory stored. So that's our limbic system where the safety radar or the amygdala resides. And these fingers are the prefrontal cortex. So this part of the brain processes all the information from below and above and thinks about how those details relate to each other. It can be understanding morality, others' feelings, how we regulate our emotions, we can make choices, etc. But so it's still a sec an emotional brain, but this one's focusing on higher order emotional stuff. But when we're, when we're in our threat system, our amygdala or our automated emotion response centre is, is in overdrive. It's trying to find ways to regulate the danger and escape the danger. In an ideal world, the prefrontal cortex or our thinking brain will step in to connect with the amygdala and help us manage the emotional responses and think about what might be the next best step. But when threat becomes frequently activated, it can be harder for us to access this connection and thereby our compassionate mind. The prefrontal cortex can go offline. And in that context, we might become preoccupied with hierarchy and blame as ways to escape from threat. We might become hyper alert to risk and danger, which narrows our field of vision. We might um, avoid perceived threats, but that makes it harder for us to connect with risk or challenge. And we might automatically revert back to old habitual ways of thinking and doing things rather than being able to develop and learn. Whereas if we can bring off, uh, connect with safeness, connect with um, others and with a sense of a compassionate mind, we bring our front prefrontal cortex back online and we re-engage with our ability to have courage and face and engage with those difficult situations, to think more creatively, to explore new ways of working from a secure base, to learn about, um, to learn effectively when something goes wrong, because we're not terrified of what the results will be if we acknowledge that that thing has gone wrong. And it allows us to more effectively take the perspective of others, which again brings us into line, into a place uh, with the families that we're trying to care for, um, allows for sincerity and authenticity in those interactions and helps us to create safety um, for their in their experience in turn. Thanks, Davey. OK, so yeah, thanks, Ruth. Um, Ruth was talking there about about the kind of threat mind. Um, that kind of dysregulated state that we find ourselves in when we are living in an environment full of threat um, and and kind of perceived danger and risk and also that kind of uh, ability for relationships and connection with others to bring uh, a different kind of part of ourselves a different part of our mind to bring us into a, a kind of regulated state um, the compassionate mind, and, and this is where we kind of turn to the idea of compassion, is really about how you use, uh, how you find balance between those um, those parts of yourself and how you navigate the relationship between those parts of yourself uh, and how you can support then using your relationship, how you can support others to navigate that, um, those, those conversations as well. As Ellie has um, illustrated with some of the kind of um, uh, hypothetical uh, conversations that were happening in people's minds when they heard about this webinar and, and about this stuff, you know, there, there are blocks and fears and resistances that we encounter towards um, uh, a compassionate mind. Um, so, yeah, the fear of being seen as weak, um, the fear of or, or the shame of being seen as, as kind of vulnerable. Um, the fear that you know turning to our 
safeness and soothing system and slowing down um, and not engaging fully with that threat will will result in some kind of catastrophe that we won't be able to come back from. Um, and the belief that compassion kind of is an excuse for you know, um, switching off or, or behaviour that can be problematic. Um, these are all blocks, fears and resistances that we, we encounter in our clinical work, in our conversations with colleagues, in our work in systems. Um, and to really understand kind of how, how to kind of work around those um, and work with those blocks, it's really important that we kind of get to grips with what compassion actually entails. So it's, it's not about um, avoiding threat, it's about turning towards experiences of threat. It's not about um, trying to get rid of threat, it's actually about really embracing and acknowledging um, our experiences of uh, stress, worry, um, shame, um, anger, all of those things, and, and really kind of creating a space for us to think about them. And then bringing uh, what I would describe as openness and curiosity, what um, sometimes we might use the term wisdom, um, to think about our motivation. So, you know, when we when we find ourselves pulled into different ways of acting or being or relating with other people, you know, where does that motivation come from? Are we doing that to avoid rejection and criticism? Or are we doing it because we're approaching the things that really matter to us? And having the kind of um, mindful awareness of that, um, a real kind of acknowledgement of what is motivating our behaviour um, is a, a crucial part of compassion. And that's hard, that's really difficult because it, it involves acknowledging that sometimes we struggle um, and engaging with that struggle uh, is a brave and courageous thing. So what needs to change? We're going to talk briefly here about um, uh, some kind of practical, I guess, well, is practical the right word? So, some ideas to bring more balance uh, between our threat and soothing system um, and our drive system. Uh, and then in the, the next couple of talks in this webinar, then um, we're going to hear some more specific concrete examples of what this might look like in practice. So the way that I think about this, um, over the, over the number of years working in the NHS, we come very familiar with the idea of like safety culture, um, and uh, you know incident reporting or or datexing or you know whatever that is called in your trust, um, is 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 labelled as you know safety culture. So that is about identifying when harm has occurred so that we can. Uh, think about how to prevent that harm from occurring or av avoid it happening in the future and this is absolutely based in our threat system it's about thinking you know when when has our threat system been activated what are the threats and how can we um, escape them or avoid them in the future so that's the kind of um, I guess the traditional the classic uh, safety culture that the NHS has used for many years uh, a couple of years ago um, there's uh, been a, a kind of a movement towards a, a new type of safety culture, which is uh, sometimes called safety two. Um, it's rooted in a kind of learning from excellence type of approach, which is about bringing around a kind of positive culture, striving for what works well, paying attention to the things that are going well so that you can grow them and have more of them. And this, it, this is uh, rooted in our drive system. So this is where we strive for the things that we want more of. What we're proposing is uh, a third approach to thinking about safety. So safety three, um, I would argue that we could think about this in the, with a different word, which is more about safeness. Um, and this is about uh, nurturing uh, connections with other people. It's about focusing on care and contentment and relationships. And this is absolutely rooted in the soothing and safeness system. And um, I think when I talk about this with people, often they uh, find the distinction between the word safety and the word safeness. Um, that's quite a challenging distinction. Um, they, they sound like they mean the same thing. And I think that a helpful way of kind of illustrating the difference that um, it fits for me, and I don't know if that's just because of like experiences that I've had over the last couple of years, but if you imagine a situation where um, you've been burgled um, in your home and there's been a, a really scary thing happen in, in your safe space, in, in your house. After the burglary has happened and you have, um, you've kind of 
worked through that in, initial stage of like processing what's gone on. There are, I guess, two different um, responses that you might have. One would be to make sure that you know you've invested in uh, a new burglar alarm, uh, a, a security light, perhaps like a stronger lock for your front door, maybe CCTV or a ring doorbell. That is that's about establishing safety. That is about making your house a, a, a place where threat cannot exists so that's about preventing harm from happening so that is a threat based response it's about avoiding harm another uh, response that you could have is about inviting um or uh, a, a, perhaps a friend has invited themselves over to your house to sit with you and listen to um what this has been like and how scary it's felt for you over a cup of tea at the kitchen table that's not about avoiding harm. That's not about making your house a, a, a less dangerous place. That's about making your house feel like a, a place that is full of contentment and connection and care. And so that for me, that's a helpful way of kind of thinking about this distinction between safety, which is about the avoidance of harm and safeness, which is about creating a context uh, that is um, nourished by supportive, caring, honest, open relationships. And if we think about um, what this now looks like in terms of the uh, the the, uh, the image that Ruth shared earlier, um, thinking about we talked about how threat percolates through the system. You know, um, the threat exists at these different layers, and it feeds up and it feeds down through relationships. Um, we can also bring our soothing and safeness. Um, our capacity for soothing and safeness to, to these experiences of threat such that if we start in that kind of the wider sphere you know acknowledging the context of, of um, you know uh, corporate targets resource constraints um, acknowledging that and also providing a, a commitment to improving that resourcing a, a wider sphere that creates a context which allows units to function uh, as safe spaces um, it allows the, the people who leading uh, units, maternity teams, neonatal teams, to create safe spaces for difficult conversations and to model those different conversations so that those leaders can be freed up to ask, how can I help rather than what's gone wrong? Um, in this context, staff within those relationships with their leaders are, are helped to acknowledge the impact of the work on them um, to feel valued, to feel recognised, to feel held in mind, and then to access these spaces to connect and to process, to make sense of what's going on. Um, and within that uh, context, the, the workforce, when they feel supported and safe, are more collaborative, are more communicative, and actually help leaders to lead in this way. And when the staff team is uh, able to feel valued, able to be held in mind, able to have their experiences of threat soothed through this compassionate approach, families are able to uh, feel this compassion percolating or flowing towards them as well. So they have their story heard, they have their experiences heard and responded to, even when that can be really difficult, even when perhaps the experiences of that family haven't been what we would have chosen them to be, you know, engaging with that and really listening um, uh, is, is, is part of this kind of compassionate approach. And ultimately babies benefit from this too, because when, they're, when their parents, when their families, when their carers are soothed, with this compassionate approach, um, they're supported to feel more close and um, connected with their caregivers. Um, and that allows us to hear the voice of the baby and hold that in mind, even again, when that can be a really difficult and painful thing. Um, and particularly when a baby is in neonatal care, you know, hearing their voice and acknowledging their pain is a really, really important thing to do. Um, so I'm going to hand back briefly to Ruth just to kind of wrap up. So we just wanted to find something and it, and it's fair to say we've been round and around trying to work out what the, the best way to end here is but there's something really important about acknowledging that we're in this together so everyone is a bit scared but we are less scared together 
um, this isn't easy work. Actually, it's it's one of the hardest things that you can do to link courageously into compassion. Um, but it's something that we think is absolutely vital for the system. And we hope that you will continue to join us on this journey together. Thank you, Ruth and Davy. Um, that was a lovely way to end and a, a brilliant presentation. I particularly liked the ways that you illustrated what you were saying with examples. Your hands model uh, was lovely, uh, your burglary um, analogy. So thank you. Um, and if people do have questions for Ruth and Davy, please do put them in the chat or, I mean, write them down and save them and you can put your hands up at the end. But we'd be really keen for you to think about uh, how you might uh, challenge them or um, want to hear more about uh, what they're talking. So um, I'm now going to pass over to Katie, um, who, uh, Katie, I hope that you'll introduce yourself, but we're really lucky to have Katie on this webinar. I think um, it's a real gift that she's agreed to, to, to talk to us today. Katie was involved um, in the psychology service uh, offering support to families who were going through the Ockenden Review, um, and she brings both that experience and the expertise in the service that she's now working in that I know she'll talk about. Um, so Katie, welcome, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you to Bapham for inviting me to speak today. I, I love the idea that we're all a bit less scared together. That's a, that's a, that's a beautiful thing. So I'm just going to share my slides, if you bear with me. Lovely. I can't see your faces, so if anybody can't see those, please do um, let us know in the chat. Oh, that's um, great, Katie. Oh, that's lovely. So uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm consultant clinical psychologist in the Shropshire, Telford and Weakin uh, locality. Um, I currently am clinical lead for one of the maternal mental health services and, and um, have been put into other maternity and neonatal related services in our area. Um, and I was formerly the clinical lead uh, between Feb 21 and Feb this year. Um, for a dedicated service for families who are part of the Ockenden Review. Um, so that's the example that I'm going to be speaking to today. So I think we're going with lots of metaphors, aren't we, today? So I think if I go with a cake metaphor, I think there's something about um, compassion shouldn't just be viewed as, as the cherry on the cake. Um, I think the thread that runs through today is something about compassion being integral to the recipe um, and certainly you know Don Ockenden's report um, you know said this was a, an immediate and essential action you know not a nice to have but a must do that actually we need to tackle this repeated theme that is coming along about lack of compassion so certainly you know very much something that runs through the Ockenden review but equally you know numerous reviews and reports um, before it so Ockerden really was this call for, yes, of course, a safer care, but also, um, you know, the importance and, and the essentialness of, of more compassionate um, care. And that being integral to restoring public trust. And again, that sense of safety and safeness and confidence, confidence um, in what our services are providing. So something about, you know, how we work as teams, what our culture is as a team. Um, and our civility um, being absolutely central to the care that we deliver. So I suppose, you know, we, we've learned lots today already about, I guess, that sort of individual and systems approach to mm -hmm. compassion. Um, and I really want to say something about how can we really embed this in the infrastructure in our services? So it isn't just compassion, isn't just seen as a sort of optional extra but that compassion actually drives how we shape our services so i hope i'm sowing a seed today uh, apologies for lots of gardening metaphors i'm a keen gardener <laughs> but something about cultivating compassion in how we design services and, and how we deliver them so um, I'm give, going to give the example of the Maternity Review Psychology Service, as I said, um, a service exclusively uh, psychology led for families who are part of the Ockenden Review. And I've arranged this as, as something hopefully you, are, you, you can take away and remember with you around six C's of compassion by design. So the first one I've started is is about the money. And I guess often, you know, often what's on our wish list is something about the money, isn't it? 
So I guess, um, you know, there was something about the maternity review psychology service being very well commissioned from the start and that being identified by commissioners that a service separate to, to Shrewsbury and Telford hospitals and the Ockenden review would be required for families to have that independence facilitating a sense of psychological uh, safety for families. But I guess, you know, anybody that, um, you know, was aware of the, the, the local and national coverage of the Ockenden Review and just, you know, how much it was splashed across the papers and on the news and really sort of flooding the system at the time, I guess a real pressure to, to do something. And I wonder if, you know, perhaps in your own services, reflecting that there often is that urgency to do something, you know, there's this, perhaps this gap for support and what do we do? And again, I'd argue that compassion comes in there in terms of relationships, communicating with the people that are giving us the money to, to offer these services, to actually have a dialogue and think about action rather than reaction. Um, and it is, you know, it, it's something about recognising the depth and breadth of need. So I would really argue that although it can sound like a, a cold sort of budget, you know, sort of dialogue, there is something about compassion through investing um, and actually having the resources to enable us um, to, to weave compassion through the services that we're delivering. Um, so I'm going to give you a bit of an example about what the Maternity Review Psychology Service offered and again uh, weaving through how, how I um, very much feel that that was designed with compassion in mind. Um, so I was the clinical lead, a uh, consultant psychologist, I guess holding the work there's something about valuing senior roles in terms of you know steering a team and families through a, through a very you know emotionally demanding and, and sensitive process so again you know I guess having the foresight to um to embed that compassion through investing in, in senior roles um we were fortunate to be able to recruit several experienced clinical psychologists to deliver support for families and also many of you will uh, I'm sure recognize this within your services something about you know admin business support that being the glue that hold you know those clinicians that those um, team members being the glue that holds services together um, so actually you know being a, in a position to offer choices for families and a breadth of expertise to be able to deliver compassionate care um, Anybody that works in mental health on the call, I believe we have a few uh, clinical psychologists, will be very familiar with the mantra of stepped care. So the idea of, you know, trying a lower level of intensity of input first and then potentially working your way through the system. Um, you know, anybody that saw the coverage panorama, for example, on the Ockenden Review and saw families with files and files of letters, you know, in, in the attic of sort of asking, asking for help. Um, and having to knock on many, many doors before any opened, we very much turn that on its head and open those doors. Um, so we, we've, we've coined this, if you like, as a, as a front loaded model. So something intrinsically compassionate about having the offer of two psychologists in initial consultations to offer families the chance to tell their story. And indeed, you know, families fed back to us that was a, a powerful an extremely powerful experience of feeling very much heard. Um, equally, uh, colleagues in mental health will recognise that often on our wish list is working with the whole family, working with systems, and this is very much what we're able to do in the maternity review psychology service. So a whole family approach and absence of restrictive barriers. So again, the doors being open rather than families feeling they have to fight. Um, so very much something about, um, you know, compassion through inclusivity, removing barriers um, and the doors being open. Just give you a moment to, to look through there um, in terms of who we saw and what we offered. So very much an inclusive whole family approach. So working with whole families, should that be their, their wish to do so? Um, or um, families splitting off to, to work with different clinicians concurrently um but crucially not having to retell their story so again the option of um families being seen by two clinicians for initial consultations um really was you know from that trauma-informed perspective of you don't need to retell this story um and something we, we're really proud that was actually 
in the Ockenden review something about this there's, there's no need for mental health diagnoses you know it, it's something about acknowledging what have you done to survive rather than what have you got you know what what's the diagnosis so hopefully you know that was experienced by families again as, as a really compassionate inclusive approach um, I'm a big, big advocate for, for co-production. Um, I, I love the mantra of nothing for us without us. Um, and, and, you know, very much that that was what we had in mind day one when we were designing how we were going to deliver our service. So something about families' voices absolutely being at the heart of, of the work. I mean, we're, we're all in our roles to serve, to serve, isn't it? To serve our patients, to serve our families. So that was very much at the heart of what we did. Um, other examples of, of how we how we did that. So maternity voices partnerships, maternity voices partnership uh, colleagues on interview panels, um, very much embracing clinicians with lived experience. Um, <clears throat> in terms of outcome measures, we're often asked, you know, measure how, how you evidencing what you're doing is effective. Um, and interestingly, some initial sort of co-production work with families, they didn't want to be handed measures, you know, their first consultation with a psychologist along the, the sort of symptom lines of, you know, what have you got and, and, and how has that been reduced when you've used the service? They, they wanted something very different. Families told us they wanted to feel these very profound experiences of, of feeling heard feeling understood and, and the one that always sticks me is it sticks with me is we wanted to be believed and you almost think well of course you know that's intrinsically we do that automatically don't we but I think something about uh, families naming that you know I, I want to feel like I can trust that professionals believe our story so um, we embedded that within our measures um, and I'm very proud to say that you know across the board 100% of our families um, said that's what we delivered. Um, through this, as a small team of psychologists, I would certainly say that, you know, supporting each other again, um, being compassionate for, for one another through the work was absolutely crucial um, to, to offer a quality service for families. Um, and I think as we've alluded to today already, you know, there's something about what is it that the compassionomics something about this this is what um feeds into a, a happier workforce where people feel they take pride in their work they're motivated to do what they do and we retain staff um so you know even within the busy pressures of a busy service um in our service we we very much um ensured we have regular time for check-ins you know how are we how are we and something about supervision um, but being a checking in, you know, a genuine question, how are things? Um, and I think how that's perceived by colleagues is then really restorative rather than feeling, you know, that it's a sort of business of checking up. Um, equally sensitive and thoughtful consideration of caseloads. Um, so, you know, acknowledging the potential for vicarious trauma in the work that we do and looking after our staff in that respect. And again, you know, in this post COVID world, always the importance of, of space and time to connect and to be together. Um, I wonder if in some of the, the questions later in the panel, this might be one that, that people have queries about. I'm a big advocate of, uh, of the, the notion of collective leadership. And to me, collective and compassionate leadership very much go hand in hand. And um, uh, the, the the West book that I think has, has already been referenced on compassionate leadership really speaks to me about, you know, this is how we promote staff to feel very much engaged and motivated and to stay in their roles. Uh, and, and there's some really powerful evidence that actually trumps all of the measures as the best, best overall predictors uh, of trust outcomes, which, you know, that's that's a pretty startling, um, a, a startling sort of bit of evidence, isn't it? And I think sometimes there can be fears that maybe, well, if we're all sort of collectively decision making or, or decision making by committee, that it's going to sort of stifle, stifle decision making. Uh, and absolutely, that wasn't our experience in terms of how we, um, you know, you know, our experiences of, of running our service. We found that on the contrary, that improves sort of openness and authenticity um an encouragement for everybody to have a voice you know for staff members to have a voice 
um, really did facilitate, I guess, creativity and trust and psychological safety. Um, and I guess working towards that core value of how can we best serve families? And that very much, I feel, sort of kept us on track to deliver the work and, and to remind us why we were there and, and who we were doing it for. Um, I think there's also something about, you know, we, we do what we do and I guess, you know, I hope we all feel very passionate about the work that we do, but equally, no service is an island. So I think there's something about, you know, when we're under pressure and perhaps feeling, you know, there's targets to meet and outcomes to meet and everything, that there's something about potentially that that, that sort of threat can, can um, you know, the blinkers go on a little bit. So I guess there's something about um, acknowledging that we exist within communities, our families exist within communities, and actually, you know, it, it's about tapping into the, the whole person, the whole family, the whole community. Um, certainly in our area, we very much acknowledge that the maternity review psychology service wasn't going to, if you like, solve that that legacy of, of maternity related trauma within the community um, and absolutely it's our commitment to continue to engage with those voices um, and I, I guess the compassionate bit to be to develop services for those who are still at risk um, of falling through the gaps. So uh, when, when uh, myself and the other speakers met before presenting today, we, we reflected, well, there's a thread that runs through all of this, isn't it? It's something about um, compassion really isn't the easy or, or fluffy option. Sometimes it's actually, you know, it, it's about courage. And I very much say that that's, that really is what it is. Um, and I, I think so, sometimes, you know, the courage to shape change I've put there you know <laughs> nothing will change if everything stays the same and I think if we really care about offering compassionate services for our patients for families it's about the courage to speak out and, and do something differently and that's what Ockenden said you know something needs to change and certainly in mental health um, you know, I experienced uh, the, the whole transformation project. So services really moving away from, you know, the notion of tribalism. This is our patch. This is the bit that we do um, towards something very much more embedding that compassionate, collaborative, um, you know, ethos of serving our families, serving our communities. Um, and I think we can only really do that if we really commit to this idea that, um, you know, comp compassion is absolutely the, in the infrastructure of what we're doing. And I think that was my last bit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katie. That was lovely. Um, people particularly liked your um, it's not the cherry on the cake. It's a key ingredient and talked about, you know, being the raising agent. I was thinking about it like the flower. It's something that's integral to the to the mix that you make. And your point about compassionate leadership that you made later on really speaks to that, doesn't it? I also liked your nothing will change if everything stays the same. And I hope that's something we'll pick up at the end. Um, so a few questions have come through. Thank you, everybody. We'll, we, we're, we're collating all of those and we'll use them for the panel. But I'm going to move straight on to, to Ria. We're really lucky to have Ria because she brings um, these two uh, perspectives that I think uh, probably sometimes a complimentary Ria and sometimes probably a challenging to sit alongside. So um, uh, Ria's a, a grid trainee working in neonatal care. She's also uh, a parent who's had a baby on a neonatal unit and she's coming with both of those to talk uh, about compassionate care today. So Ria, over to you. Thank you, Ali. Um, just get my slides up. Please let me know if these aren't um, on up. Bear with me. No worries. That. Yeah, up they're up. There we yeah. go. <laughs> OK, so um, as Ali said, um, I'm Maria. I'm a neonatal grid trainee uh, at Birmingham Women's Hospital, um, and I'm talking a little bit about why compassion is important in the neonatal unit. Um, so we're going to go through a definition um, why I'm talking uh, compassion in the context of being a NICU parent and a NICU doctor uh, and then some take home points at the end. Um, and we've seen this uh, definition before uh, in Davy and Ruth's talk, and I think the points that really stood out to me for it um, were um, the ones that I've highlighted. Um, and so I was thinking about self in terms of um, 
me as an individual or you as an individual, but also as a collective um, of health professionals. And I think traditionally we might see others in terms of the families that we look after, um, but um, hopefully we can see others as our colleagues as well. Um, and the second part that I've highlighted, I think offering um, sometimes the suffering that we see in our families uh, and, and our colleagues um, can seem really big and messy and, um, and sometimes it can feel like there's nothing that we can possibly do to um, actually address that. And um, I guess the danger is that we just don't even try. Um, so I'm talking to you because I've worn the hat of NICU parent um, and NICU doctor. Um, and so just bring in a little bit of lived experience, I guess, in, into the chat. Um, I know I'm not unique in this um, and some of you may have similar experiences, um, but I think that there's a lot to be learned from listening to people's um, experiences and I hope that um, share what I'm sharing uh, will raise some discussion points um, and link in well with the talks we've already had. Um, so I became a NICU parent in 2018. Um, my daughter Beatrix was born at 28 plus five weeks gestation um, and you can see a picture of um, myself with her and my elder daughter Flo who was three at the time. Um, she is thankfully a, a thriving five-year-old now but uh, the first two years were were stressful to say the least um, between uh, almost 10 weeks on uh, the neonatal unit and then further admissions to Peds intensive care and general paediatrics um, on a couple of occasions in the following couple of years. Um, and then, as I've already said, um, I'm a grid trainee. I've spent the last uh, five and a half years working across two separate um, ne tertiary neonatal units, um, and I've worked at uh, three other level two units as well. Um, and there's a hugely fetching picture of me at the start of the pandemic, um, all um, gowned up, ready for a sterile procedure. Um, so, I knew I was going to become a NICU parent um, at around 27 weeks into my pregnancy, but we were hoping we'd get closer to 34 weeks. Um, but whilst I was sat on the antenatal ward, I naively thought that because I had uh, worked on the unit that B was going to be uh, on when she was born, uh, that I had some idea of what it was going to be like. And I guess just like um, you really have no idea what parenthood is like until you've become a parent yourself, um, you've, you've no idea what parenting is like on a neonatal unit until you actually experience it. Um, overall, it was, uh, I guess, a roller coaster of emotions um, and really, really exhausting and overwhelming. Um, on one hand, I was this joy and love at my um, my new arrival, um, but it was all kind of intermingled in this guilt and sadness and, and anger really uh, at what I perceived to have been my body failing to protect her and keep her from the suffering that she was going through. Um, and that was kind of quickly followed up by pride and awe watching her overcome some of the obstacles that she did. But parenting is, is really odd on a neonatal unit because a lot of the things that you uh, naturally perceive as parental roles um, can be uh, undertaken by the nursing staff. And so you can feel really lacking in control, um, lacking in purpose and a little bit helpless. Um, at the same time, you're hugely grateful that there are all of these trained professionals that are able to step in when you um, ultimately need to go home. Um, and I think uh, just an undertow of the entire experience was uh, dread. Um, there was just this constant uncertainty of what the next day would hold. Um, there was always this fear that maybe something awful would happen and, and she wouldn't come home at all. Um, and initially I thought maybe this was because of my experiences of working on a neonatal unit. Um, but having made some friends with some of the other parents, um, uh, it was actually apparent that it seemed they also had this experience as well. So some of the things that at the time I found really helpful and, um, and looking back would have potentially been helpful uh, were when people took the time to actually get to know us more as a family. 
um, to understand our perspective on things. Um, your perception of what's happening um, as a professional is often a million miles away from the family's perception and don't automatically um, perceive that the family with what you perceive as the sickest baby on the unit or the most premature baby on the unit will be the family that um, is the most distressed. I think, you know, if I if I asked each one of you to uh, consider that at this precise moment in time um, I would drop into your lives a preterm or sick baby some of you might think okay that's that's pretty awful but I could probably gather some people to help me and um, and I'd be able to fit that on my plate um, albeit it would be uncomfortable others of you might turn to me and say my plate smashed and my my world's crumbling to the ground and that's kind of how it is isn't it everybody's lives are different um and um we've we need to kind of get to know the family a little bit to be able to understand how this neonatal journey is for them being human was really important and that sounds like a silly thing but what i mean is having normal conversations a lot of the time the conversations that we have with parents are very transactional medical war drowndy type of of um of conversations but throwing in there just a bit of normality can really help um it can help it helps me feel a bit more grounded um and kind of be able to have a bit of headspace that wasn't just constantly thinking about um the realities of of what was happening with b i've put respect respect the bed space in um I am a bit of a control freak, but the, uh, the neonatal units, as I said, you, you lose control. Um, and the bed space for me was an area where I had a little bit of control. Um, I at least knew where all the things were. They were in a spe uh, kind of a specific place and in a specific order. But also for me, it was um, like a small extension of my home. Um, and especially when my daughter and my husband and um, visitors were there, you know you kind of blurred out the rest of the unit and um and settled into a little bit of family life as best you could and i think it might be your neonatal unit and that that's where you work but that little space is is that family's only kind of re thing that resembles home whilst their baby's in a neonatal unit so just kind of thinking about that when you step into the space um, I was also really um, struck by some of the interactions that the staff had with um, with B, and uh, I definitely felt far calmer and far more trusting of staff that I could see had made an effort to make a relationship with her, whether that be the way that they talked to her, um, the way that they left her um, in terms of her looking cosy and comfortable. Um, and it's something that probably I hadn't considered before um, being a parent on the neonatal unit, how impactful that is um, on, or how impactful that was on my mood as a, as a mother. Um, and listening ultimately. Um, a lot of the times we come to parents because we have news that we need to deliver or information we need to give. Um, but for me, having some space where people came and actually they were giving me some time to listen um, to what and to hear what my concerns were um, and what my questions were, which often won't be what you think will be the top concerns from a medical point of view, um, was really powerful because when I had unanswered questions and unanswered concerns, I wasn't kind of completely present and it was really hard to connect with B because I had all these thoughts whirling around my head. Moving on to doctoring and I, I was really um, it was really nice to see that there's such a kind of MDT representation in the meeting today um, and clearly I can only speak to doctoring because I've never been anything else um, but I'm hoping that you will all see some um, some things that are familiar and some things that um, you can relate to. Um, I feel really privileged to do the job that I do I think it's a hugely rewarding job um, but it is um, 
a very challenging job at times um, and increasingly we are um, providing care that is hugely complex um, and really pushing the boundaries of survival um, which leads to a lot of really difficult um, sort of conversations and decision making um, and I think with all of this um, increasingly complex care and our continued drive to get better and do better and, um, and provide more, we can sometimes lose um, lose the perception of time and we, we, or we feel that there is no time, that there's always something more that we can or should be doing. Um, and we don't allow ourselves the time to kind of stop and take a minute. Um, or we think that we just don't have the time to do it at all. And I think the danger of that is that, especially for our, our more junior staff, they start to see us interacting um, with these situations that are really distressing and really hard, and then just moving on, like literally and figuratively washing our hands and moving to the next thing. And that becomes normal. Um, but it, it's a million miles from what a normal day is. And I think that there's potentially a lot of damage we can do in terms of retaining staff. Um, and um, certainly for me, when I was working environments where that seemed to be how it was, um, I started to question whether I really wanted to stay um, in the innates. Some of the things that I've um, really benefited from um, and from talking to other members of staff they found really helpful um, working in such a, a difficult environment um, are the following and, and the first one really surprised me initially so when I first started working in an environment where success was celebrated and I'm not talking about my own success um, but other members of the team little wins, big wins, you know, somebody getting a difficult cannula, somebody having a publication, whatever. When they're celebrated, um, I somehow felt like it was kind of a celebration uh, of the entire team. And um, and it, it buoyed my kind of um, my spirit as well. And I felt like if I was doing something um, that was was even remotely good, like a, like a um, a difficult cannula, then uh, that would be celebrated equally, and it really showed that there was a um, you know a sense of we're in it together. Um, some things are hard, um, and you you know if you've done something well, um, we celebrate it together. Um, just like we all learn from hard things that don't go so well. Um, I think we're really bad sometimes in, in medicine at actually celebrating the good things. So that was that team spirit that comes from celebrating others um, successes um, was sort of um, a very different experience, but a very helpful experience. I think the, the next two points, the acknowledging um, emotional challenges, this I think is is really difficult and I think a lot of teams uh, that I've worked with have struggled with it but um, especially within the neonatal intensive care environment you know we do see a lot of, um, of really difficult things a lot of distress um, and suffering we witness true miracles I think as well but um, the the hard things um, it really makes a massive difference if as a team especially the more um, senior members of the team are willing to at some point come back to you, whether it be immediately afterwards or in the days and weeks afterwards and just say, do you know what? That was that was quite challenging, wasn't it? And, you know, I've been thinking about it and I found X, Y and Z difficult and um, and I've had, I had this experience before and this is how I de deal with it. And just sitting down and talking about it a little bit um, uh, and acknowledging the emotions around it. Um, it, it. I think sometimes that feels a little bit fluffy and a little bit uncomfortable for medics, because as I said, we've got this kind of um, nature that we just kind of wash our hands and move on. 
but actually um, it's been really beneficial for feeling that as a team we can share things together and we can move forward together and that if you are finding something hard it's okay that's normal it doesn't mean that you're not cut out for this profession um, and I think that it's really important to have more junior staff um, if we if we want to attract them to um, to into this field. And then finally, nurturing team spirit. And I love this picture at the bottom. Um, it's of the space um, outside at um, the neonatal unit in uh, the women's hospital. Um, it was just some slabs and some benches. Um, but at 11 o'clock, essentially, most days, um, unless there's a patient safety issue that precludes it, we down tools and we go and have a cup of tea together as a team. Um, and it's really important for us. You know, there's no agenda. You just have a little break. But um, the conversations that you have, you learn more about your team um, and I think it, it helps with our work in general. But actually it was during one of those breaks where somebody had the idea of making it into a, a really um, lovely little space with the fences and the, and the garden. Um, and it's, it's an absolute joy to be able to have a little bit of um, tranquility um, in, in what can be a really difficult environment. So the take home points then, um, neonatal units can be traumatic environments for families and staff. Um, compassion shouldn't be yet another thing to do. It shouldn't be a tick box exercise. We can incorporate it into everything that we do. And it makes a massive difference to families, both during their journey, but also in retrospect when they're thinking back on their journey and reflecting. Um, and it, we know that it can help staff morale massively ultimately a happier workforce is a more effective workforce and I think that you'll find that just like smiles and laughter that compassion actually is quite contagious. Thank you. Thank you Ria and you were getting so many lovely comments you'll have to go back and, and read all of them uh, it was really lovely to see what we really liked about what you were talking about was was you sit on both sides of the fence but you're actually quite thoughtful about both of those um, and what it's like from both perspectives I think that was what was really really uh, so helpful and, and insightful about your presentation so thank you so much so I'd like to invite all, all of the panel now to switch on their cameras um, uh, we've collected the questions that have already come into the chat but uh, if we've got time we will also ask, answer any questions that people bring so please do feel free to put your hand up um i'm going to start um katie this question to you first but then uh, everybody else can kind of pitch in and answer it um because uh, this came around the time that you were talking how do you think staff can be reassured that their their intended compassionate approach is experienced as compassionate by either babies or families or by staff Thank you for the question. And interestingly, I was I was reading that and I was very tempted to respond. And, th and then I, I realised, Ria, you were answering it beautifully on your slide. <laughs> you really were. So what you know, you, you, you said, didn't you, understanding the family's perception that just feels so central, sort of walking in their shoes, I guess, being human, listening. Um, but I think, you know, it, it is something about almost boiling things down that seem very complex and are very complex to those human fundamentals and I think that question of how can I be helpful you know how can I be helpful it's such a I, I spoke about open doors didn't I in my presentation it's such an open question how can I be helpful and I guess you know that that other thing about courage to really hear and respond if there are ways in which you know things that might be unhelpful so it, I guess it's that openness and curiosity but I think where you um you answer those things really beautifully actually um, as that question came in. Lovely thank you it was making me think as you were talking there's something about your intention to be compassionate but also thinking about what the other person needs and when those two come together that's truly compassionate care isn't it. Okay Davy and um, Ruth a question for you and then everybody else can jump in as they see fit. Um, people are wondering how do we support babies and families and ourselves to move through the states of threat drive soothed. I wonder if you could just talk to that. Go on, Davey. You can see it. I, I, I was waiting. No, I was waiting for you. <laughs> I, I, I think um, it's it's a great question. I, th I think that there are lots of different ways. I, I, for, for me, it's about um, having a holding space so that um, 
so that we're there to support people through that through those transitions um that you know a lot of the stuff that we've spoken about is about relationships today it's about kind of holding a space for each other um you know in in the what we were talking about you know the, 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 that green part the soothing system what Casey was talking about in terms of the the importance of colleagues and checking in with each other um and also in terms of rear and and you know that kind of team ness that team togetherness like it's it, for me it's about relationships and it's about attending to our relationships and most importantly i think it's about making the time to attend to those relationships and having the resources to be able to do that we talk a lot about relationships and time and how what a challenge it is to create that space but i suppose what one of the key messages today hopefully that's come through over and over again is that actually that's a cost saving effort in itself isn't it actually if we invest if we can create time to be with people to hear their stories and to to meet them where they are then actually overall we we improve outcomes for everybody and efficiency ultimately too um so yeah it's a hard message but a really important one i think in terms of a compassionate mind approach i suppose there are there's a whole series of practices and and kind of um tools that you can use to to activate your soothing and safeness system to help to bring you to um back into to connect with your compassionate mind and that's stuff that all of your neonatal odm needs and your regions will have access to those sorts of things if that's something that you think would be helpful on your unit um and is something that we're working on as a team nationally to try and to roll out more of that but actually ultimately um those are tools which are a proxy for the relationships that you have with people i suppose that ultimately you need those relationships first of all really in order to be able to do this work well wow. Um, and it's been lovely in the chat seeing that that's happening um, across the board, I guess, that I guess family integrated care has emphasised the, the importance of relationships, but actually the relationships between staff and families themselves are equally important and equally central to this work. And our relationship as those who sit maybe slightly outside of the system sometimes with the staff too, to be able to provide some of that containment as well. Thank you. Um, uh, Ria, I have a question for you. Um, uh, and I think you have started to talk to this, but I wonder if you could just answer this specifically. Is compassionate care just being nice to our colleagues uh, and getting along with everybody? Or is there something else that, that's important there? Uh, yeah, no, I, I mean, no. <laughs> um, I think it's it's that effort to actually kind of, much like you want to get to understand a family's kind of perception of what's going on and, and um, a family's background it's it's just trying to gain a better understanding of of your colleagues and, and where they're coming from and um, and I think only by understanding them a little bit better will you really be able to actually delve into thinking about helping them if, if you see that they're suffering um, I think it's really hard to to relate to their suffering if you, if you don't know where it's rooted um so yeah just a, just a, a little bit more effort to actually understand and know your colleagues i think lovely thank you now davy this has been asked to you directly but i think everybody could probably have some thoughts on this but i'll go to you first davy how do we and the we could be the unit the organization the nhs move from promoting resilience to promoting psychological safety and compassion that that's great I don't know yeah I saw that um thanks Oliver I don't know if that's because you know that I have a, a real difficult relationship with the word resilience um I think it really depends on what what like what you mean by resilience it's a word that's often used in 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 kind of staff well-being stuff that we need to be more resilient um it puts me in mind of a, uh, a trust that I used to work in uh, uh, many moons ago who uh, did a kind of staff well-being thing um, and the the image the, the vis visual image that they used to advertise this was um, a hard hat was a like a building site with a hard hat which was about um, giving us the tools to be able to kind of sustain ourselves in this like very challenging time um, and it, it, going back to that the kind of the threat drive soothe thing for me that's about you know preventing harm rather than uh, fostering what I would think of as resilient so resilience is a I think it originally comes from like the engineering um, world as, as a term um, and it's about adapting to kind of to challenges um, and um, yeah I guess being able to kind of tolerate strain um, 
and there's lots of different ways of doing that and we can do that from our threat system by thinking about how to avoid uh, distress and how to avoid difficult um, experiences but ultimately for me uh, what 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 that question included about kind of psychological safety and compassion actually for me that can be a way of fostering resilience because if we if we're able to sit in our compassionate mind actually we're better able to work flexibly um attend to threat when it's there turn to relationships when we need them um and for me that's what true resilience is about is about being able being able to flexibly turn to the parts of ourself and our networks of support and relationships that we need to i don't know if that answers your question oliver but um i don't know if you had a, a, a question underneath that question or i don't know if any of the other guys have got other thoughts I would just add that I think it, I mean I completely agree with all of that, and I think that resilience we have to start seeing resilience as a collective responsibility, not an individual one, don't we? I think there's nothing wrong with the word resilience if it's a shared perspective, because when you're dealing with all the things that you are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis in this world, you need some resilience. That is, a, it's a something that everybody has enormous amounts of actually, but things are being thrown at you all the time, and so actually our strength is in our connections, in our relationships, in that network of support that makes us flexible, as Davy said, to turn towards things. Um, so it isn't something that you can point at somebody and say that they're not being resilient. What we have to ask is why, how is the system not helping them to withstand everything that's being asked of them? Thank you. And now, I think this question, which has come from Catherine, really does get to the, to, to the heart of some of the challenges. Um, and I wonder if, Katie, if you could answer and then uh, Ria, maybe you'll have some thoughts on it. How do we enshrine compassion in our work when we're so often pressed for time that we can't even stop to eat or go to the loo? I feel like I strive to work in a compassionate way, but I also feel the trauma I absorbed is never acknowledged or addressed due to lack of time. Um, so how do we in enshrine compassion when a there's not enough time but also our own needs are not being met um uh, katie if you want to go first and then Rio, you might have some thoughts i, I guess i just wanted to say um Catherine, that I, I found that quite difficult to read because absolutely it speaks to us as being humans too doesn't doesn't it there's a book uh, i'm not I'm certainly not plugging it and no money involved but that called also human you know that of, of, of course you know health professionals are human beings and you absolutely need the time to go to the loo to eat your food to stay hydrated all of those things so i, I guess my first re reaction was to feel real concern you know maybe not surprised because i'm aware that's that's what it can be like but concerned that that's what it is like um you, you know and then and then i guess i felt quite angry about it <laughs> you know we're speaking about compassion today and that doesn't always mean you so you know sort of being very sort of fluffy and warm about things sometimes it's about getting angry about the things that need to change um, and, and certainly you spoke Ria didn't you from a you know from a from a leadership perspective of actually looking to to senior role models with that and saying are they taking time to pause taking time to attend to their own needs um, dare I say it to acknowledge their own vulnerability or to model showing that vulnerability to show that we are all human so you know I, I, I'm not sure it's, it's a practical suggestion Catherine but I think something about you know the courage to say these need to be givens of us looking after ourselves um, you know that old cliche of we can't pour from an empty cup and if it's absolutely the basics aren't happening I think that almost is the time to get sort of a bit bit rebellious and a bit angry about things and say you know these things absolutely must happen it's another must to do isn't it Thank you, Katie. Ria. Yeah, um, I, I think I, I would echo what Katie said, and I think, I guess, in in some, uh, it's not a quick fix at all. Um, in some circumstances, it's acknowledging that some days it's harder to do than others, uh, and 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 acknowledging that you can't be perfect. So, so you know, some days you you will do a much better job than others because time and everything else will allow it um but i think as as katie said that's it's kind of a almost an institutional change that needs to happen there and i've certainly worked in some places that are better than others and i do think that it's about the way that um the leadership is with within that particular organization and and um i I'm, I don't know <laughs> how to solve that, but um, but I do think um, you're right. It's um, it's making sure there are enough people make enough noise about it. Thank you, Ria and Davy. 
Yeah, I, I just think this the, the conversation about time is a really interesting one because I think I have heard myself say um, many times, you know, compassion actually doesn't take any additional time. Um, and there's some of the literature around compassionate healthcare shows that actually it's like the investment of an extra 40 seconds within a consultation makes the difference between um, the the kind of the outcomes in a cancer clinic. It, like it's not huge amounts of time um but but then at the same time i think it, like it absolutely is about time because in order to be able to practice in that way in the moment to moment day to day uh the thick of it like on the ward you have to have a, a, a space to kind of take that stuff and for, for me as a psychologist like i have supervision to do that and you know for me that is not only a kind of a place to learn and grow but also a place to kind of restore and nourish and um like so many staff working in neonates and maternity services i think particularly nursing staff don't have access to those spaces because there is a, a kind of a lack of resource um and that brings me back to what um Casey was saying, you know, the, the, the compassion through investment is fundamentally what I think the, the answer to this is, is about actually recognising that compassion does take time. It doesn't take time at the point of delivery. Um, it takes time in its preparation and, it, and it, that requires an investment of resource. Yeah, agreed. Thank you, Davey. I'm glad you got that in there. All right. So we're coming towards the end. Thank you so much for the questions. If there is a question that you haven't answered, but you're really keen that we do answer, please pop it in the chat and we'll make sure that we look at those afterwards. Um, uh, and I'm sure we could link something with the, the recording if we need to. So I just wanted to share one final thing. I'm just going to share my screen so that you can see this. I think people come to webinars like this and feel really passionate about the things we're talking about. And that's clear from the, the conversation in the chat. But it's difficult to go away knowing so what do I do about that? And we also know about CPD generally that, that we uh, are fired up straight away, but a week or two later, it's difficult to see the impact that that's had on your practice. So I just want to remind you, lots of you will be familiar, familiar with this model. I just want to remind you about how you might go about doing something about it and putting this into practice. Um, and there may be things that you feel concerned about, like how far to truly compassionate care, which uh, the panel have just talked about. Um, uh, but and maybe it feels like you're concerned about wall practice and protocol uh, closer to your influence, possibly depending on your role in the unit. But there are also things that you do have influence on. Perhaps that's um, next time you write a policy or write a standard operating procedure. Uh, perhaps it's how you run meetings or perhaps it's just your own behaviour. And as Davy just said, at the point of care, the compassion doesn't really take any extra time. So I just want you to think about what is it that you could do? It might not be everything and it might not be enough, but but the things that you can do that you have control over might be a good start. So as we come to the end, I just I'm really grateful to BAPM for giving us this forum, um, uh, particularly to Kate and Marcus for helping us facilitate today. Thank you very much for having us. And um, uh, they've asked me to say that if you'd like to become a member of BAPM, then uh, please do look on the website and do that. I'm sorry, my dog is here and is really would really like some of my attention, uh, which is why my arm keeps moving around. Uh, I, I also want to thank all of our panel members. I'm really grateful for all of you giving up your time, not just today, but all the preparation, the thinking that's gone into this. And it's really clear that lots of thinking has gone into it. Um, I'd really encourage anybody who's um, on the call who doesn't have contact with their lead psychologist, maybe doesn't have a psychologist in their unit, to make contact with them. And you can find all of our contact details at the back of the staffing standards. So um, if you need them, you can look there. Um, uh, uh, the National Leads are running a conference next year uh, around Easter time. So look out for that if you're interested in thinking more about um, compassionate care and psychologically informed care in neonates. In neonates. So uh, anything else finally from the panel before we close? Just a huge thanks. It's so wonderful to to feel that I can feel the energy in the chat, I suppose, in the sense that we are on this journey together. So it's really, really appreciated. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming today. I can't believe that we finished early. I thought we were going to run over and we've given you two extra minutes to go and have a wee and get something to eat. So thank you very much. And it was lovely to see you all.